All right, well, good afternoon. Uh, big thanks to the IH Conference Committee for inviting me to speak today. It's always a privilege uh, to have the opportunity to speak. And I just want to acknowledge my co-authors, uh, Mark Heron from Northern Iron Water and Connor Lydon from uh, Consultants Tetra Tech. And yeah, as John says, I'm going to be talking about bringing groundwater back into public supply. And really the purpose behind this is um, I've had some experience of uh, in the last five years of of uh what well, i'm going to speak about bringing bring groundwater back into public supply and and it's really targeted at the lessons that we've learned uh over these last five years um bringing a hydrogeologist mindset into thinking about um how do you get water from the ground into public supply um i've come across a few challenges with that i've met engineers i've met economists i've met uh uh you know chief executives and the it's different thinking than we as hydrogeologists necessarily think. We have to think about the whole perspective and not just think about it from a hydrogeology perspective. I'm trying to be innovative by giving consideration to, to all areas. And I thought this would be a useful talk, not just for anybody that's going to be involved in um, uh, water supply into public supply purposes, but if you're involved in even projects that, you know, there's quite a quite a high demand. Uh, from a business or from maybe a group water scheme or uh, for some other purposes, uh, some of the lessons that we've learned uh, over the last five years so far uh, may prove useful uh, in uh, in some of your thinking. So the, pa the paper's in the proceedings and you can always go back to them by looking at the website. Um, and for, for those of you that were on the field trip last October, you'll have seen that it's pretty exciting times uh, for hydrogeology in the north of Ireland. It hasn't always been that exciting. But it is at the minute. Um, for some years now, the, the Geological Survey of Northern Ireland, who I work for, uh, we've been advocating for a better consideration of the use of groundwater in public water supply. Uh, and those ex efforts are now actually coming to fruition, which is really nice to see. From 2004, however, following recommendations from the 2002 Water Resource Strategy, almost all the groundwater supply points were taken out of service in Northern Ireland, all except just one on the tiny Rathlin Island right off the north coast. Um, that meant that 13 boreholes and three spring sources were mothballed over a few, period of a few years. But at one stage before that, we had 126 megalitres per day of a total supply of around about 700 megalitres per day um, came from groundwater. <clears throat> and today that one, that one supply up on Rathlin Island uh, contributes only a quarter of a megalitre per day at its peak uh, in the summer whenever all the tourists are over there. However, from 2016, we've seen some green shoots of hope starting to appear, um, providing an uninterrupted supply of clean water to over 99% of dwellings and businesses in Northern Ireland. Yes, you heard me right, 19, over 99% of Northern Ireland is covered by uh, Maine's water supply. It's an incredible figure. Um, but it's also a massive engineering challenge. Um, anybody that takes it, it takes it for granted that you can just turn water on and water comes out of your tap in your house or where you work, um, <laughs> it's not something that you should take uh, take for granted. It's a serious engineering achievement uh, and challenge to be able to do that. And Northern Water achieves that, which I think is incredible. But however, recent global events have driven a need for fresh innovation to ensure Northern Water continues to meet its targets for water supply. And this talk is going to discuss some of those lessons uh, that we as hydrogeologists have learned over these last five years as Northern Water have gone through a journey towards starting to consider using groundwater again. And I use that word consider quite heavily because it has been a consideration, not a jumping into to do. Um, so what have been some of the drivers for innovation? Why, why go back to groundwater when such a big decision was made just over 10 years ago? Like it's not that long ago that they decided to shut everything down basically. Well, I don't know if you've noticed, but the world has changed a lot in those 10 years and being able to deliver clean water to consumers has been affected by this. Firstly, we've got climate change. When you have three out of the last four years with abnormal long, dry and hot periods, you start to think, when this leads to high demand episodes with consumers using up to 30% more water than normal, when you see we see your service level reservoir, low level alarms going off all over the place. And when reservoir, lake and river levels are on a downward trajectory, you have to do more than just think. You have to do something. 
How can our water supply network be more resilient to high demand events? How can we maintain our water storage provision to ride out these increasingly frequent long dry periods? Well, one option, as all us hydrogeologists will know, could be to strategically use groundwater. And hopefully you're all thinking, yeah, groundwater's got some decent properties. They can help. Yeah, so groundwater is a potential option. Secondly then, energy. Water supply requires high energy consumption for both pumping and treatment. It's unbelievable how much water or how much energy, well, yeah, water as well, but also how much energy goes into uh, getting water right to you. And not only that it's there, but it's also clean. Treatment involves a lot of energy as well too. Northern Ireland water is the largest consumer of electricity in Northern Ireland. And every time there's a price hike, I'm sure all of us have experienced that over the past few months um, to unprecedented levels. Northern Ireland actually feels it more than anyone. Uh, Northern Ireland water feels it more than anybody. Coupled with that is the drive to reduce carbon emissions, like we hear all the time, which is really super important. Northern Ireland water are committed to a 50% reduction by 2030 and to be carbon neutral by 2050. So the question is, how can they get clean water to their customers by using less energy? Well, it's a massive challenge, um, but one option could be to strategically use groundwater. So I'm going to look at some of the lessons that we've learned over the course of these past few years as we've started looking at it. And it has been a, a big journey. It's been mostly a journey of hearts and minds, really, because to go from a big decision to shut everything down, uh, all the groundwater supplies down, to then going back to that, you have to convince people that there's a real reason why they need to consider it differently. There were good reasons in the first instance, um, and it, it, it takes a, a lot to, to consider otherwise. So firstly, um, my advice to Northern Ireland Water originally way back at the start was to aim for best quality water that they could find. You know, as hydrogeologists, that's, that's programmed into us. That should be your top priority. Excuse me. Um, I viewed it that this was more important than the yield. And it turns out that this is actually a very simplistic view. And it's whenever I look at it only through the eyes of being a hydrogeologist. Um, it's perhaps a helpful view, but it doesn't consider wider issues such as the technical and economic challenges. Now, what I would say is that yield is probably the primary consideration for public water supply unless special conditions apply. Anything less than about one megalitre per day from a single source kind of isn't really worth considering. Why is this? Well, firstly, what we we'll find is that all raw water has to go through some form of treatment, even if it's just to keep it clean for its journey through more fairly dirty pipes. Low operational expenditure treatment solutions often mean high capital expenditure. Uh, much, much more than the cost of a borehole. I can believe the first time I saw the, the, the proposed costs for the treatment solutions, way more than the cost of just drill, drilling a single borehole. Um, and the more water that can go through this treatment solution, in other words, the yield, and the more economical it's going to be and therefore way up against other alternative supply options when it comes to that optioneering stage to look to address some of the water supply resilience issues. Therefore, yield is, is the key aspect and, and quality is important, but less so when it comes to yield because the water is going to be going through treatment anyway and it's going to get treated. Now, my big caveat that I'm putting in here because I know I'm going to get questions about this, anticipating it, is just because groundwater is going to be treated either at an existing water treatment works or an on-site package treatment system, it doesn't mean uh, it doesn't mean a strive for high quality groundwater should be abandoned, definitely not. Less resilience and treatment solutions will ultimately require less energy, less space, less chemicals, less operational maintenance, and it's going to be more economical in the long term. So we don't just throw away that. Let's try and get the best quality uh, groundwater that we can. Let's you know push for a good borehole structure like we all all know is really important. It still is really important, but in in what we have discovered, yield is the most uh, important consideration. <clears throat> So in an ideal world, as each new challenge on providing a public water supply comes along, the whole, the, the ideal situation would be that the whole water supply network should be redesigned from scratch. Um, however, the reality is that there's not enough time or money in the world to be able to do that. The pipes are in the ground where they are, the service reservoirs are where they are, 
Um, sadly, it doesn't mean it, it does mean that over the years, water supply networks do start to represent something more like a patchwork quilt, or the more cynical amongst us might suggest a bucket, fu bucket full of holes that keeps getting patched up. Um, just because a population lives right above a great aquifer or very close to one, it doesn't mean that a groundwater solution is that easy to integrate into the existing water supply system for that population. With many water treatment works located close to impounding reservoirs and lakes and upland settings, which tend to be underlain by fairly low yielding aquifers. Acquiring high yielding groundwater solutions close to them is difficult. Uh, it's sensible to try your best to make long-term uh, sensible choices to integrate with what existing infrastructure there is. Uh, and doing this may also reduce capital expenditure. Some of the required infrastructure might already exist, such as uh, trunk mains. So initially also, uh, one of my a piece of advice to my water was to prioritize bedrock aquifers due mainly to prioritizing quality over yield and bedrock aquifers potentially having better groundwater protection. However, with a number of Northern water, uh, water treatment works um, located either on or near to some good sand and gravel aquifers, and since boreholes can often yield one plus megalitres per day from sand and gravel, gravel aquifers, Pumping groundwater either directly into the supply source, such as a lake or reservoir, for the water treatment works, or potentially directly even into the water treatment works, doesn't require much in the way of new treatment solutions. And this makes a big difference, not only to the water supply resilience in the area, but also to the capital expenditure for such a scheme. Therefore, such sand and gravel aquifer solutions have tended to stack up very well compared to alternative solutions. Granted, source protection is very important uh, in, in these cases. So this has been probably one of the big lessons learned, and we've learned this the hard way. Um, but as a rough guide, if you hope to properly construct an efficient and easy to operate groundwater production borehole for public water supply, you should probably factor in having to drill around five exploratory boreholes. Now, we should have known this because whenever we look back through our records to back in the 70s and 80s, when there was a lot of work in this area in Northern Ireland, that's what they did. Uh, that's what the guys did. They drilled exploratory boreholes. And then on the basis of those results, they designed and constructed a production or a couple of production boreholes in a certain area. Um, a production borehole is an engineering structure it's designed to get water out of the ground efficiently and cleanly. And if you were to build a new apartment block, trusting solely a desk study on what the ground conditions are could cause your cost to spiral and land you in a lot of hot water. Um, the same applies to a production borehole. Uh, by the time it comes to constructing one, you should have good confidence in where it should be drilled, what it will, what will achieve in terms of yield and quality and what structure it should have. If it's to be included as part of a capital works program, the way the contracts work, there isn't any room for much uncertainty, um, especially of deciding the structure of the borehole as you're drilling it. You really need to have that that spec and as part of the bill of quantities uh, long before it even a, a rig gets on site. Therefore, my advice is to front end with an exploratory drilling and pumping test exercise, which is informed by a solid death study exercise. Um, and from our experience, drilling production boreholes solely on the basis of a death study definitely leads to problems and it makes it a lot harder to manage expectations and i'd say this is the one thing which has probably caused us the most harm in terms of the hearts and minds aspect of all of this uh, with with northern water fortunately northern water actually still retained many of their former production boreholes um, however most of the infrastructure had either been removed or wasn't really in great shape however the boreholes themselves they prevailed no surprises there um, these have a number of great, great advantages. Firstly, uh, we're in the Geological Survey of Northern Ireland. Uh, we probably retained a lot of the original reports on the borehole structure, why they're located where they are, any issues such as boundary effects, aquifer properties, pumping test results, etc. And secondly, these production boreholes were the result of themselves exploratory uh, projects. So chances are they are going to tick the yield and potentially the quality boxes also. Thirdly, if they haven't been sold yet, the land is actually very valuable. Even if the structure of the borehole is not ideal, it may be possible in some cases to drill a new production borehole within the same land package. Fourthly, if they were operated as production boreholes before, then the, the water had to go somewhere. 
uh, which means there will probably be ma uh, mains leading away from them. Um, they may not be in great condition, but the cost of replacing them will probably be a fraction of the cost of laying new ones. And then lastly, lastly, they'll probably already have some electricity supply coming up to it. Uh, so making a new connection should be a lot easier uh, to get in there as well. This can therefore be, be used for both the pumping tests and for recommissioning. Um, therefore, performing a suite of tests to assess the viability of bringing such sites back into service appears to be proving profitable and a fairly swift solution to addressing some of the reliance issues. Um, what we find is that a borehole camera survey uh, followed by a step and constant rate pumping test for about a week or so at a rate at or exceeding its previous operational level with, uh, with collection and testing of samples is a fairly cheap exercise which delivers reliable results to inform a business case for bringing such sites back into service. So my advice is if you have boreholes anywhere or in the country that aren't operating at the minute and they're being considered for being sold, my advice is um, try and advise them not to do that. Um, boreholes are going to be very helpful in the future uh, when it comes to uh, you know, a new consideration of new water resilience issues. Um, then when large, this might be con uh, uh, quite controversial, but I'm going to suggest avoiding springs. I'm going to expect a, a, a lambasting for that, but here's my thinking. When large springs were used in the past, it was because they were great for producing one plus megalitres per day of effectively free water. However, the climate for water supply has now changed since then. The main issue is acquiring an abstraction license. If you propose to abstract all the water coming from a spring, you're effectively asking for a surface water abstraction license, which will dry up a stream or river if you take all the water from the spring. Um, the Northern Environment Agency will understandably not grant the license for that. Therefore, you must provide a compensation flow which reduces down the yield. On top of that, spring has little or no protection from being contaminated. It's effectively a stream and it's, it's vulnerable to contamination of the aquifers as well as overland flow, making them potentially highly vulnerable to contamination. In one case, when we were surveying a former supply spring, in fact, this spring collection chamber that you can see here, um, about 10 meters above where the stream collection chamber was located, um, and it was about 150 meters downstream of the actual spring. Uh, we find the discharge pipe from a septic tank, um, and that was going straight into the stream. Um, so this uh, this spring collection chamber is uh, definitely out of service. Um, so in that case, instead of abstracting from the stream, what was proposed, this was a sand and gravel uh, stream, uh, a nearby borehole is going to be used instead, which only reduces the flow in the spring by about 25%. Um, and acquiring an abstraction license for that is much more straightforward, um, whilst at the same time having more confidence in the long-term water quality stability. And for Northern Water, that just gives them a lot more confidence in, in being able to operate this efficiently and effectively as well with any, any interruptions to service. <laughs> The value of pumping tests. As hydrogeologists, we all know how awesome and cool pumping tests are. Just to state the obvious, they can produce great results that you can use for all sorts of things. They blow a desk study out of the water, in my view, um, and there's definitely no substitute. Engineers need precision, and when it comes to making a business case, a desk study assertion that a proposed borehole could yield, say, two megalitres per day versus a pumping test result of one megalitre per day makes a big difference. So what's the lesson learned? Do pumping tests, advocate for pumping tests. There's definitely no substitute for them. Plus they're great fun as well to, to carry out. Um, early engagement with stakeholders is important to ensure that all the permissions, licenses, approvals, consents are acquired prior to a new source becoming operational, plus building good relationships with all the people and officials involved in the different areas. Um, in the case of what we've been involved with, these include water order consent, drinking water inspector consent, extraction licenses, electricity connection upgrades. You're going to have to hope that you actually have the power available in an area as well too. Um, telemetry signals approval for all the monitoring and operational equipment, rivers agency consent, potentially even planning approval for the new water, uh, for the uh, water treatment uh, uh, solution that's going in. And also an effluent consent, because if you're going to have some kind of filtration system put in place, there's going to need to be a backwash of that, and you're going to have to discharge that somewhere. These are some of the things that you don't normally think about. 
Um, so definitely more things than I thought uh, originally. Also expect the unexpected. Um, something which came along in 2021 was a letter from the Drinking Water Inspectorate um, to Northern Water informing them that following a review, that mild steel must not be used in any borehole construction and components for abstraction from boreholes. Um, now, if you're using good old plastic or even stainless steel, you're fine. Um, and it, thankfully it doesn't apply to existing boreholes, but it meant that um, that definitely had to alter the way that uh, some of the contracts were, were built. Uh, and my understanding of it is, and we need to get some clarity on this still, uh, mild steel can be used for conductor casing. Um, and you should try and get that out of the ground after you've drilled the boreholes where possible. But so long as it's not in contact with the water that's being produced, then it should be fine. So really important to make sure that you have good cement grout in there between your conductor casing, the mild steel and that, that's used to get down through the soft sediments and the competent bedrock and your uh, uh, casing, which is being used for your pump chamber casing as well for, for final production boreholes. So conclusions. Here's some of what we've learned in the past few years when it comes to bringing groundwater back into public supply. So changing weather and carbon emissions are driving water supply innovation. They're gonna to have to rapidly change. To meet those targets that I mentioned, there's gonna to have to be some real root and branch changes to the way that water is supplied to consumers in North Ireland. Um, more resilience and fewer emissions, big, big targets to have to try and meet. Uh, borehole yield is key. Anything less than one megalitre per day is probably not worth pursuing. Um, I was thinking of putting in the statement there, it's not worth getting out of bed for, um, which is kind of true. Um, that in some of the meetings that we've been in, some of the guys not on water, just if you mention anything less than one megalitre per day, just glaze over. It's not just, they just don't think about it. Um, idealized hydrogeology doesn't work with existing water supply infrastructure. You have to work with what exists. Um, sand and gravel aquifers are more attractive than you would first think, perhaps. And definitely exploratory drilling is essential with any new site, even if it is um, for a, a, you know industrial application or something like that. I'd highly recommend advising and factoring in uh, drilling explore, exploratory boreholes beforehand uh, and then looking to get a production borehole drilled after you've assessed the results of that, uh, that exercise. Um, former production boreholes, although they may not be up to the standard of David Ball's IGI water well guidance, guidelines should certainly be investigated. Avoid springs. Pumping tests are awesome. Spread the word. Set loud. Um, start engaging with stakeholders early and you're going to need uh, everyone on board and watch out for mild steel. Um, and that's what, that's all I've got.